All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for being here, making the trek from the various sides of the Capitol to get over here. Uh, and uh, we are very excited for, uh, I believe, the first ever uh, briefing that I'm aware of specifically focused on early Head Start. Um, on the infant toddler care that, that is so, so critically important and, uh, and, and, and excited today to, to hear all about some of the latest research, um, all of the, uh, which just confirms and affirms a lot of what we, I think, already know uh, about really the power that Early Head Start provides. Uh, my name is Tommy Sheridan. I am the Deputy Director of the National Head Start Association um, and am really, really uh, honored to be joining uh, a, a very distinguished panel of these three um, that are up here today. And before I introduce them and, um, and turn the conversation over to them, um, I wanted to first of all express our gratitude, our appreciation, um, our thanks to the Congressional Bipartisan Pre-K and Child Care Caucus um, on the House side who we are partnering with today to, to share insights and bring attention uh, to the priority of infants and toddlers and, and really the opportunity of services for, um, for those younger children, which oftentimes get, get, get forgotten about as we're talking about preschool and, and childcare in a lot of spaces. So before I actually turn it over to our, 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 uh, our, our distinguished guests from, from all, over, all over the country here, um, I, it's my honor to introduce um, uh, to everyone uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro. Uh, Congressman Castro, who in the early childhood world really doesn't need that much of an introduction, uh, given the, uh, the role that he has played and continues to play in early childhood, represents, of course, the San Antonio, Texas area, and has, has long, as I said, been uh, a champion for Head Start and for children. Uh, more importantly, of course, he is one of the co-chairs um, of the Bipartisan Congressional Pre-K and, and Child Care Caucus. So, Congressman Castro, uh, please join me, and thank you, as always, for your support. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you and great to be part of this event. Uh, my name is Joaquin Gosser, and I have the honor of representing my hometown, San Antonio, Texas, here in the House of Representatives. And I'm now in my fifth term. And a few years ago, in 2016, uh, a group of Democrats and Republicans founded the Congressional Pre-K Caucus. So my public co-chairs are Assistant Speaker Catherine Clark of Massachusetts, uh, Representative Tom Cole, Republican from Oklahoma, and I, we came together uh, to launch the caucus, which has worked over the past six years to increase the number of congressional champions for high quality child care and pre-K. And in 2019, we were delighted to welcome a Republican Congressman, Rodney Davis of Illinois, as a caucus co-chair in recognition of his work to expand federal support for child care providers. The National Head Start Association has always been a big key partner in the caucus's efforts on Capitol Hill and I want to thank Esmina, Bob, Emily, and all of the NHSA staff for their dedicated work, strength, and bipartisan support for Head Start. Uh, as some of you may know, my city of San Antonio has been a nationwide leader in expanding access to high quality or early education. In 2012, under an initiative that was pushed by my brother, Leon, uh, who was mayor at the time, voters in San Antonio voted to increase the sales tax by one eighth of a cent to fund a program called Pre-K for SA. And over the last 10 years, Pre-K for SA has grown into a successful program with a major impact on educational outcomes for thousands of San Antonio students. Earlier this year, Pre-K for SA opened enrollment to three-year-olds and expanded access to free pre-kindergarten pre 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 for families making less than $75,000 which covers, as you can imagine, these things are cheaper in Texas and San Antonio, it covers a large swath of the families in our city. But together, Pre-K for SA and San Antonio Head Start program serve more than 5,000 students and play a critical role in many, meeting our city's child care needs. Uh, it's also a collaboration with the local school districts, most of whom participate in Pre-K for SA. And recently, our local Head Start program joined forces with Pre-K for SA to offer a Child Development Associate credential or CDA, which allows them to enter the early education field as assistant teachers. And as our economy recovers from a recession that disproportionately hurt working mothers, this investment in our workforce is creating bright horizons for our families. For more than 50 years, Head Start programs have been at the forefront of educational innovations. And the federal government must make sure that every program has the flexibility to grow, expand, and meet the evolving needs of individual communities. San Antonio, I believe, is a great model for how investments in early childhood education can change lives. But there are similar stories I know in cities across the country in both places that are considered red areas and blue areas. 
The children who qualify for Head Start programs are America's poorest kids, with most coming from families with annual incomes below $28,000. Without intervention, many of these children would enter kindergarten behind their peers, even though they were born, I believe, and I know we believe, with the same God-given potential. Thanks to Head Start, it doesn't have to be that way. Study after study shows that participation in Head Start programs leads to a wide range of benefits, from higher rates of college completion to higher earnings in adulthood. And as we look ahead to the challenges that we face on the global stage, there's never been a more important time to pursue programs like Head Start than now. With an educated citizenry, our nation can seize the challenges of the future and show the enduring resilience of the American experiment at home and around the world. And thank you so much for all of your work and also all the impact that you're having in the lives of young people in this country and on the nation itself. And also as a father of an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, all of whom have already benefited from free education, but also the father of a four-and-a-half-month-old daughter, uh, I want to see these programs and head start strengthen so that all of our children can have a wonderful chance in our country and can live up to their own potential. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And he's still awake, too, even with the four and a half month old uh, at home, right? <laughs> I love that. Well, welcome, everyone. And, and, and again, and realizing, is, this, is the mic on? Can folks hear it? OK, all right. I forget that you have to like, push buttons and things to turn them on. So apologies for, for not doing that. Um, for again, those of you who just joined, uh, my name is Tommy Sheridan. I am the Deputy Director at National Head Start Association. Uh, and we're thrilled, really, to welcome you to what, what we're aware of is, is one of the first briefings solely focused um, on Early Head Start and the power of, um, of Early Head Start. Um, you know, for over 25 years now, uh, Early Head Start has been at the vanguard um, of serving pregnant women, uh, infants, and toddlers, and now serves um, over, uh, over 220,000 children a year through a tuition-free, high-quality model, community-driven model as well. We've long known that Early Head Start has significant positive impacts on children's development and health, higher immunization rates, uh, early identification of disabilities, better language and cognitive development, uh, stronger families, ultimately, at the end of the day. And today, you're going to hear directly from some of the experts that, that are following this, that have spent throughout their careers uh, quite a bit of energy and quite a bit of, um, of, of, of effort into tracking the outcomes around Early Head Start and tracking, uh, really, the power of that, as well as running Early Head Start programs uh, themselves. Uh, you're going to hear from Dr. Rachel uh, Chasen Cohen uh, about how Early Head Start achieves those strong outcomes, helping children from, from birth, actually prenatal, um, to age three and their families uh, on the path to success and to opportunity. Her presentation, uh, and that her presentation really spurred us to say, we got to get this in front of Capitol Hill. It is so powerful. There's such incredible stuff. But again, we all looked at it and we're like, yeah, this is common sense. That's what we think. But then actually seeing the research affirm that and really go through that, I think, is, is, is something that is so critical um, for us and, and really for all of you uh, in your role as, as, as policymakers um, in, in general. Um, after her presentation, uh, we'll have, she'll be joined by two esteemed colleagues, two esteemed leaders uh, in the early education Karen uh, space. And that's Dr. Tammy Mann and Dr. Brenda Jones Harden. Uh, they're going to both help us unpack this new research uh, developed from the congressionally mandated Early Head Start Research and Evaluation Project study. Uh, Dr. Cohen's new findings are significant. Uh, and our take on that, NHSA's take, is, is that it's proof that we need more high quality and reliable infant toddler care using the Early Head Start model of comprehensive support. And not just for the benefit of children, right, but, but really for the families. Millions of families, especially women-led households, uh, they need more support to be able to go to work, uh, to further their own education and job training, uh, and to make their own family budgets work, really to achieve economic success and, and frankly achieve the American dream. Just like Head Start's preschool services, again, Head Start is the three to five, early Head Start is prenatal to three. We often talk about them collectively as all of it is Head Start, including Migrant Seasonal Head Start, American Indian Alaska Native Head Start, early Head Start, and I could go on and on and on about all the various types of models that are really dependent on what happens in individual communities. Um, but, but just like those preschool services um, uh, that were the impetus and model for a lot of state pre-K systems, Early Head Start has the potential to inform a new wave of investment in infant toddler care that some states are starting to invest in and take note on, uh, but really is an opportunity, I think, on the federal level for us to uh, really take uh, even more action 
if Congress continues to authorize and invest in the center-based, home-based, comprehensive services uh, and workforce that make early Head Start uh, shine across the country. In fact, today Congress is considering a reauthorization of McV, the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Um, and uh, in that process and, and in that reauthorization that is being considered, uh, has the ability to double the funding uh, of the home visiting program. And that would include an, an, a small expansion of Early Head Start's home visiting work too. Early Head Start is one of the approved models um, of the McV program. Um, also today, NHSA and, and 700 Head Start advocates um, are, are up on Capitol Hill uh, who are fully supporting this initiative, also asking and, and calling for your support uh, at, at making sure we can really try to address the workforce crisis that we're experiencing, uh, the realities that are, that are taking place across the country in our programs. And you'll probably see people in these lovely purple shirts uh, all, over, all over Capitol Hill today. Uh, we just had a rally with, I think, 17 or 18 members of Congress uh, out front. It was wonderful. Uh, many of your bosses were probably, or were there, um, I know from some of you. And, um, and uh, again, it's, uh, it's it's an absolute wonderful opportunity for us to focus on early Head Start uh, and some of this new research that came out. So I could go on for the next 20 minutes uh, reading bios of each of these, each of these three ladies uh, individually. I'm not going to do that, uh, but I want to be very, very clear that they are the experts. Um, these folks are world class uh, in the US. Everybody looks up to them. I've heard names, their, their names since I started working for Head Start uh, 13 years ago and have been absolutely honored and privileged to be able to interact with them throughout the way. So I'm going to do a really brief introduction on each of them uh, and, then, uh, and then I'll turn it to them to actually get into what you're here for, right? Which is talking about all of this. So first off is, is Dr. Rachel Chasen Cohen who is an associate professor with, with UConn, uh, University of Connecticut's Department of Human Development and Family Services. Her research focuses primarily on the biological, relational, uh, and environmental factors that influence development of at-risk children, which is who Head Start and Early Head Start prioritize um, and serve, and most especially on the creation, evaluation, and refinement of intervention programs for families with infants and toddlers, like, like Head Start. Um, she has spent a lot of time overseeing and, and working through a, a variety of projects um, that, uh, that, that, that explore and, and consider um, really the effectiveness and, um, and, and how to improve, again, how to refine, I love that word in, in your bio, um, the services that we provide. Next to Dr. Cohen is uh, Dr. Tammy Mann, um, who has worked at the intersection of research, education, and policy um, for several years um, in, in, in the DC area, we'll say broadly. Um, she, since 2011, she served and currently serves as the president and chief executive office, um, officer of the Campania Center, which is Alexandria's Head Start and Early Head Start program, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and uh, there they serve, uh, they reach over 2,000 children, teens, and adults. Um, beyond, besides that work, she, she worked as a, as a role serving as the Vice President of the Virginia Board of Education, the Chair of the Provider Advisory for Virginia Pro, uh, Promise Partnership, um, and uh, the list goes on. Uh, I was joking, I said I see her probably up here more often than I do uh, in Alexandria right by our offices, even though that program is, 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 is incredible and running a lot of, of wonderful, wonderful things. So excited to hear her, her background from knowing the research and also directly being part of the conversation. And then finally, uh, all the way here on my right, your left, uh, is Dr. Brenda Jones Harden, who is a professor of child and family welfare with Columbia University's School of Social Work. Prior, before, prior to her, her tenure at, at, at Columbia, Dr. Jones Harden was the Allison Richmond Professor for Children and Families um, at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, which really was leading that way and talking about a lot of really critical things around early childhood space. Across her time, she has worked and, and consulted with and provided training for and, um, and worked closely with numerous organizations uh, regarding effective home visiting, infant and toddler, or infant and early childhood mental health, infant toddler development in general. She's currently the president of the board of directors of our, our partner organization, Zero to Three, um, and uh, has, has continued to really be a strong, strong voice uh, for at-risk uh, children and families who we're here to talk about today. So I said I wasn't gonna keep it too long. I literally could have gone on for another 10 minutes about each of them. These are experts. Let me turn it over to you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Well, that was quite an amazing introduction. I hope we can certainly live up to that. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here with you today, and I'm going to share some new findings, but based on old data. And we're looking to see how comprehensive two-generation services provided by Early Head Start lead to the impacts that we find for the program. 
Um, and I'm really delighted to be here with you all, the Pre-K and Child Care Caucus, because we want to think with you about what these findings mean for the programs that you think about. So that is um, our goal today. I'm really pleased to be here also to talk about an infant-toddler program, because we know about, um, there are some special things about the infant-toddler period, right? It is a period of unparalleled growth, right? And we know that the caregiving environment provided in the home and outside of the home is especially important when we're talking about infants and toddlers. And we know that these opportunity gaps that were referred to earlier start to show up during this period of time. So we know when we're thinking about early childhood services, we have to be thinking zero to five, right? And actually, the study that I'm gonna be talking about today, we found that those children who were in early Head Start, followed by formal care, three to five, did the best when they were ready to enter kindergarten. That's not the focus of my talk today, but I will bring in a little bit of data around that, okay? Because I think that's a really important message, especially for you all to hear. Okay, so I thought I would start just for those of you who might not be as aware of what Early Head Start is. I think we got a bit of an introduction, but I just want to be really, really clear and make sure that we understand what do we mean by comprehensive two-generation program, right? What does that mean? That means we are there to provide services for children and for families. So Head Start has always said whole child and whole family, right? So the child, we work on child development um, improvements through services directly for the child, be it in childcare or through home visits, through working on the parent-child interactions, right? So that's focused on child development and parenting. And then there are comprehensive services aimed at improving self-sufficiency and healthy family functioning. And those services are for children and for their families. So they might include things like health and mental health services, um, disability services, job training, education, economic supports, all kinds of different economic supports, housing, and I could go on and on, right? And early Head Start programs, like Head Start programs, have those Head Start program performance standards that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And they outline what are the kinds of services that Head Start needs to be paying attention to and early Head Start. And that they have to work with families to develop the goals that families have and the types of comprehensive services that might help them get to their goals. Programs also work to figure out for their communities what array of program options work best for children and families in their community. So some programs choose to provide home visiting services, some choose to provide childcare, and some provide multiple options. So we know that Early Head Start had an impact on these services that children and families got. So the Early Head Start families were more likely to get employment services and job um, education and job training and early intervention, I mentioned that one earlier, and childcare and home visiting We look to see how did those impacts lead at age two, how do they lead to the impacts at age two? Okay? So that's what we're going to summarize, and we have a wonderful one pager that actually summarizes a lot of this for you. Um, so what we found, I'll just briefly, um, there's a lot more detail, but I'll be brief. Um, the education and job training services were really, really they predicted impacts across every domain. They were predicting impacts to children's social emotional and cognitive outcomes. Um, they were predicting positive parenting behaviors and support for learning in the home. And they were um, affecting parenting performance. And we were really interested to see that employment, we thought employment would likewise be really, really important. And it was. It did have an it did lead to the impact on children's social emotional but it seems that it's getting the education and job training experience that helps families get a better job, not just any job, that leads to these better health okay. Looking at parenting and child development knowledge. So this is that two-generation parenting piece that has really been a calling card of early Head Start and Head Start from the beginning. Um, and that led to positive impacts again across a huge range about child social emotional 
emotional, cognitive, and language impacts, and also with the positive energy and supports for women. And the thing that really interested me about these findings is that the support home visiting probably was a little bit more effective in getting these supports, but case management and group parenting education were all effective. Right? And that's something I think we really haven't known. We often aren't sure of what, especially group parenting, I've heard people be a little bit um, unsure about what the benefits of those programs are. But this research shows us that yes, they benefit children. Early intervention, this one I also was really excited to see is that the early head start got the children into early intervention, and because of this early intervention, Children had better led to be positive impact on child language and child cognition. So this is actually causal support for early intervention. That really doesn't exist in this world because we don't randomly assign children to get early intervention services or not. That would not be that. Right? So this is a really exciting finding. And then there's hours of childcare, and that also led to a positive impact. So again, that's a validation of the importance of the hours that children were spending in this high quality childcare. It led to positive impacts for child cognition and for parents and care. So I'm going to summarize now so we can get on to the discussion of making meaning of some of these findings. But in summary, we find that the comprehensive services provided by early head start or referred to, right? They didn't have to provide them like themselves, um, contributed to the positive impacts of the program tax. And, you know, we think um, there's a lot more that we want to learn. We want to follow this out to grade five and age five, right? I hope we have those other time points. This is just page three finding, so you know, stay tuned. We're going to have some more information for you down the road. Um, but we do feel that these findings in and of themselves lead to an implication that um, we can do this in other programs besides the we Head Start, that providing comprehensive services to children and families um, can be done through other um, early childhood programs. And, you know, I think I'm excited about the fact that we really have an opportunity to launch children on a positive trajectory, not only through the services that we give to them directly, right, through child care and pre care, but through how we help their families, right? So we can help their families address their own goals around self sufficiency and creating a positive environment in their homes and positive parenting behaviors. Um, and, you know, we think that, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit, we've already had some preliminary discussions. We think that understanding um, these effective ways to support families well-being in this comprehensive way is particularly important during this time when like all families, but especially low-income families, are really facing new challenges as we recover from, from the pandemic. So we will talk about our current world, and then we say that our whole will talk about our current world now. Um, I just briefly want to thank um, the, the families and the children who led us into their lives for so long, and the many people who were involved in that initial study. I won't read all their names, but it's a large group of people, and then also the smaller group of folks who've been working on thinking about comprehensive services and what we need to do for the start, and we've been working for the past that. All right, I'm going to stop talking now, and I have lots of questions for my friends over here. Um, Rachel, um, I hope you all can hear me. I have a big voice, um, so I don't necessarily need it, but thank you so much. The first thing I want to say, though, I want to echo something that Tommy started with, and I will just say this to all of you who have some influence on congressional people, 
that we do not have the services we need for babies in this country. Although early head start, as Tommy said, is serving over 200,000 kids, that is really a small fraction of the babies who live in low income communities. So before I go into what Rachel specifically asked me to say, I have to say we need to be better about our babies. We just have to. Low income moms do not have the kinds of child care options that other moms have for their babies. And as you know, infant care is very expensive and it is also not available. So we have to do better. We have to do better. So I just had to put that out there and I'll probably say it another two or three times. But based on what Rachel said, I think what she is arguing for with her research is what sometimes we call an early childhood system of care, where we know that child care in and of itself is not sufficient. It is not sufficient to get babies and families where we want. So we want a more two-generational approach in the way Rachel talked about, all the services you heard her talk about, education and training for parents, so that parents can learn at the same time that their babies are learning. But you also heard her talk about things like case management, which is old-fashioned social work, and what that means is doing an assessment of what these families need and making sure that they get the services they need. That is not often done in child care. It really isn't, because child care subsidies basically pay for the care of the children. So we have to think about a broader way of thinking about families, and Rachel's point that this might be particularly important for this age group, I think, is very, very important to think about because we know that babies respond to this caregiving environment that allows them to be sensitive and nurturing. And if parents can't do that because they're depressed or they don't have jobs or they don't have education, then you know it's going to affect them. Similarly, the workforce, which I'm sure Tammy will talk about, can't respond to babies in that way. And just one more thing that I'll um, just say before I turn it over to Tammy, that what we have found in a lot of our work is that when we look at child care or pre-K in and of itself, the children do better with cognition and language, which Rachel talked about, but their social emotional outcomes are tight. They don't get the kind of outcomes just from that kind of program, partially because there's not a specific focus in the way there is in the way they start. Like Rachel said, the whole child and the whole family, there's not a specific focus on nurturing a child's social and emotional well-being. So we need programs like Early Head Start that we know place a priority on that, in addition to all the things that we think about in terms of school readiness like how well, you're going, to hear, you're going to hear a lot of things echo because, of course, you know, um, the work that Rachel articulated is it should not be a surprise. Every day I have the opportunity to live out this work at the ground level in the community that I have been serving now for a little over a decade. And I can tell you firsthand that when parents come in for support and services, they're coming in. Um, because they want the best for their children. I've never encountered a family that walked through our door and did not say, I'm here because I want to make certain I can get my child off to the best possible start. And what we have found is that when we wrap support around families, as they want to see their children thrive, um, they respond. And so when we talk about what it means to engage in these services that Rachel noted, really seem to be associated with better outcomes in our own program. I saw this really intensified during the pandemic with the families that we were serving because, of course, the isolation that many of us had to live uh, through during the most intense months of the pandemic, we, we stayed open. We provided services during that time. And I can tell you, for the parents that came on those Zoom calls, and we had many Zoom calls with mental health professionals, um, also parent education supports, you could see the relief 
on their faces as they heard other parents talk about the ways in which they were trying to cope with the impact of the pandemic. And I think this notion of support in parenting, when you think about, you know, children, they grow up in the context of families. So it makes sense that when families are feeling stress, that children will be impacted by that. In the same manner, when children, when families feel like they have access to the resources that they need to support their children, children will do better and they will respond to that. I think the early intervention finding, as Rachel noted, I hadn't really thought about it in the Wookiee that She noted, I mean, it is obvious that we are not assigning children randomly to studies to understand the impact of early intervention. But I can tell you, we do, we do operate early Head Start and Head Start programs in addition to programs that we get state funding for. We grade funding to really make quality a reality in our programs. And I will tell you that on the early intervention side, um, I'm thinking about a father that had two of his children in our program as infants. And these kiddos are now um, well into elementary school. And one of his children really was struggling, um, developmentally speaking. And we convinced the family to go through the process of evaluation. And sometimes it's hard. Families are, can be really reticent in these early years. But I will tell you, this dad got back in touch with us to say, you know what? I just cannot thank you all enough for what it meant to get those services early. Because now my children are not only doing well, they're excelling. They're in gifted and talented programs because we were able to, at the very early stages of that child's life, connect them to resources in the community so that early intervention support could be provided. And so I can't underscore enough how important it is to be thinking about programs that serve young children um, in a holistic way. When you know that that word, as you share in our own reflections, it's vital for the success of children and families. It is intellectually, physically, 
emotionally demanding. It requires an enormous understanding of young children and how to best support their development. And I feel like if we cannot get this compensation right, we are, children are going to be affected. Parents are going to be affected because they're not going to be able to engage in the workforce because they're not going to be people there to support them. I have so many more questions that I could ask Brenda and Tammy, but I do want to leave time for you all to ask some questions too. So I want to wrap up our discussion part of the event by asking, um, we were asked actually to provide recommendations to you. <laughs> so, you know, this is kind of a fun thing to be able to do. And I think that Tammy and Brenda have already done some of that. I'm going to start us off and I'm going to stick to the data. Um, needs and we need more longitudinal data okay we need to follow children over time this is old data that i shared right um we used to have better longitudinal data sets for those of you who might be aware of the early longitudinal birth uh, the early longitudinal survey birth cohort, that was a, an old study of the Department of Education, fabulous longitudinal study. That's it was also around 2000 that that one was done. So we don't have current longitudinal data. So both on early Head Start and beyond, we need, in order to learn about development, we have to have longitudinal data. Um, and in order to understand the role of these services over time, we need to have longitudinal data. Um, we can talk about the random assignment versus non-random assignment. That's a whole other question. But I just have a plea for longitudinal data. Um, I do want to mention that um, uh, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation that does research on Head Start and Early Head Start um, is collecting fabulous data, um, and it's descriptive data of children in the program. They have moved to doing more cross-sectional. And I understand why, because I used to be an OPRE, and I ran these longitudinal studies. It's really hard to do them. They're very messy. They're very expensive. But I do think we lose something when we go to cross-sectional um, research. But I will say that those studies have done such a better job than we did about asking about services. We, we were first gen. They are now moving forward, um, and they're doing a much better job asking about services. I just wish we had longitudinal data. Um, again, not just on Head Start, but on children um, in general. I wish we could follow the children in the study that I just shared with you. They're adults now. We could find out what the long-term effects of these services over time are, but we don't have that data. Um, and I also want to just, another research need, and again, um, OPA is doing something right now. They have a study in the field looking at how Head Start programs coordinate comprehensive services for family, and I think that's really, really wonderful. That's really important. And um, I think we need to do research on what it's like to provide those comprehensive services in programs other than Head Start. So there are some states, like Red Island and many others, um, that are um, attempting to provide some comprehensive services in pre-K. We need to study that more. How are they doing? How is it working out? The early Head Start child care partnerships give us great insight there, too. Um, so I'll leave it there. but. I know you've already given us a lot of recommendations, but any additional ones or any last comment on the ones you've already provided? Expand early Head Start. <laughs> I mean, 250,000 kids, as Brenda and Tommy said, that's, that's a drop in the bucket that's based right. on what the need is. So we definitely need expansion, and we need compensation address. And I will just add that I totally agree with everything Rachel and Tammy have said, but I also think we need to think more carefully about early intervention. Tammy raised that issue before. Um, early intervention really cannot serve the numbers of low-income children that they need to serve. Oftentimes, um, you end up seeing um, a lot of kids not getting the services they need. So I would argue for that. I would also argue for um, uh, 
more money that's dedicated to pregnancy-related services in Early Head Start. Um, and I'm going to put a plug in for home visiting. Um, Rachel talked to you about home visiting and the parenting issue. What she didn't say, and Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, that one third of the programs in the original study were home-based programs. So I think, um, yes, we should be funding center-based programs to give parents who work an opportunity to have childcare. But what the home-based programs are able to do is really improve the parenting of the parents, which really ends up having long-term effects on, on children's outcomes. That's a very good point. And I will say that as time has gone on, the majority of early Head Start programs offer multiple options so that they can really tailor the service for that individual family. Um, but that's a really good point. All right, we want to open it up to questions from you. Any questions for any of us? <coughs> in our program, we have a very diverse community, um, and we have um, managed to evolve how we approach uh, families, multilingual families. Um, it's not uncommon for us to um, communicate in four languages when we engage with families, um, certainly in terms of written and um, having access to translation services, interpretation services that are necessary um, as we're working with families where English may not be their you know, primary language spoken at home. Um, and so the staff that we hire um, many times um, are also able to speak the languages of the families that we serve. Rachel mentioned this, this idea of Head Start Child Care partnerships, and I will say that we are an agency that's working with um, 16 or so family child care providers in our community because we find that many more families or infant toddler care is, is more readily available in family child care. And so our work with those family child care providers because they too tend to match the home language more so of the children that are being served. Um, we work with them uh, to help support them in their ability to use curriculum and invest in um, uh, building up their skill around assessment and things of that sort. So I, I, I'm certain that it varies in communities. But we happen to live in a community where there is access to staff that um, allow for that connection in addition to having to bring in ancillary support services through interpretation and, and the like. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about the work these systems are available? That is a really good question. Um, families in general for Head Start. Well, partnering with NHSA is a really good thing to do. Um, and they are helping us get the word out, I think, widely. Um, I love this one pager that they put together. Love it. Um, I, you know, I sent them my summary, and it was long, and it was, you know, and I'm pretty good at summarizing the research, but, but they really are good at it and, and getting it out there to programs as well. I think families need to hear this, but I think programs need to hear this. Um, and, you know, I always love to talk to providers because I want them to know their work really matters. And, you know, this, especially the family support workers, you're right, Brenda, they are often the kind of um, unspoken heroes and some of those. Um, yeah. Good question. Yeah. If I could add to it, in terms of preparedness to learn about what Head Start really Head Start is, that is something that for the Head Start regulatory agencies are agencies that that's their job. Some go as far as doing door to door, like they will go to houses, especially in really low income communities and, and, and knock on doors, uh, spread it through 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 out, right? A lot of other parents, including other families, um, going to um, uh, uh, faith based uh, places and really getting the word out. You can see even in the Outlook and Outlook and the Outlook area, and you go into a couple of grocery stores up there and literally see advertising to that start program that are into the grocery stores up there. So you will start seeing it more often than not. Uh, but that's also something that you all can help with. Um, 
putting out press releases, putting out publications, encouraging your comms teams to be talking about it when the bar enrollment drives, when there's new funding opportunities available. That's something that we always jump in. Our team's happy to help kind of assist with that when there's things that they do go back home. You're going to every single congressional district across the country, so if you're, if you're uh, looking for another bond, it's worth you got to turn back here. I believe Bob, I think we're nearing the end of our time. Did Bob want to pop up? Or? Um, I didn't want to do it. Well. Um, okay. oh.